second, the other first. Uh, let me get the last two that just wandered in. On time, by the way, no, uh, no critique there. Um, Mateo and Catherine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. That's seven. That's enough to go ahead and have class. Actually, um, for all the folks that are invisible and don't show up, today is kind of an important day that you're missing because I introduced the projects, which is 15% of the grade. And the projects are supposed to be done in teams. So there will be a, I guess with seven of you here, there's going to be a quiz appearing on Blackboard. It'll be an easy quiz. The quiz will be identify your teammates. Um, so teams of preferably three to four people. In the past, I've assigned the teams. That's usually a disaster. So I'm not going to do that. Try to let Blackboard assign the teams. That's its own type of disaster. On Blackboard, you should be able to see your other classmates. Can anyone tell me if that's correct? You can communicate to them? I think in groups, you're supposed to be able to. However, you have another option, which is the laboratory, because there's the chat box. And I will be repeating this in the first part of the lab. So you want to put together a team of three to four people. And by this Friday, I want to know who that team is. I bet you red was a really poor color choice on this brown black ground. Is that right, Catherine? Yeah. Let me go ahead and click on the fonts a little bit and see what we can do. And if you don't want to use people and you have pets, cats, snakes, they're fine too. And actually, if you have a snake, that would be actually kind of cool. Especially if it's a snake that spoke Python. And I'll be making all the quizzy stuff during the lab today. Um, so for, for what it's worth, you know, the seven of you in here, you all can make two teams and, and be done with this shit. You never have to deal with the invisible people. And, and if that's what you choose to do, that's fine. Just, just communicate to me who the teams are. And then for those of you that are watching this by video, um, hopefully you're actually paying attention because this is a portion of your grade and it's enough to take you from a vowel to a consonant. So um, so that's the uh, introduction to that. Let me go to the web server and let's take a look at the see if they're linked. Okay, so in the web server there's a set of potential projects. There are currently there's only two that are worth a crap that I want you to consider but there's going to be a third one added during lab which is similar to the other two. So there's a concrete strength prediction and you you can read this and what it's asking for <coughs> is uh, building a model of concrete strength based on blast furnace slag, fly ash, coarse aggregate, fine aggregate water, super plasticizer, and age as inputs. How strong is the um, concrete going to be? And you've done something similar to this for homework already. It, it's the same database. But there's more. <clears throat> in addition to building the model and documenting it, you're to make a training video on how to use the model 
and demonstrate the tools as they are run. Um, in the past, teams that do this, some teams do really great, and other teams do fairly pathetic on the training videos. Because it's probably the first time you've ever been asked to make a training video and you have no idea what it is. So you go to YouTube and see what other ones are and realize that you don't have the financial resources and the fancy programmable emojis to do the training, so you have to make your best shot on it. In addition, make a video of how you managed the project. So that's how you assign to your team of three who did what. So-and-so was the head boss because they were unworkable in any other fashion, so they just waved their bony fingers at the rest of us, and so-and-so did the actual coding, and the other one wrote the report. A little bit more detail than that, but that will give you the gist of what goes in that video. And then there's a interim report, and I don't think the dates are, the dates are pretty close. This is from a different time. Um, November 23rd is our last class before Thank Heavens, which is that holiday where you say, Thank Heavens, it's almost over. And um, so this date is close enough to that. Uh, I don't think I'll change it. Uh, and then the scheduled final exam day is when the second part of the project is due. Reserve the last. I think we have a class meeting after Thanksgiving. One, one whole meeting. Which is stupid, right? But tell that to the people in the big building. Um, so that meeting, I'll ask you all to come up here and present in five minutes or less your uh, your project. Um, <laughs> it's just you, you 11 who show up, that'll be quick. We'll be out of here in 20 minutes. Um, but ho hopefully maybe more folks will show up. It's, it's okay. It's their, it's their uh, vowel. Um, all right. And so on the final exam, day, the actual project. You'll be using JupyterLab notebooks. Those can be separate in separate notebooks or all single notebook, as can the report if you really want to play with the markdown features in a Jupyter notebook. You can do the whole thing in Jupyter. Um, so that is the project. The purpose of the project, does it actually say it's here? It doesn't. Um, one of the things we're scored in is how students demonstrate that they can work together. It's insufficient to say, I got it off a of Chegg and my fellow classmate gave me the link. While that is working together, that's a level of cheating we don't want to acknowledge exists. So don't do that. But um, this is your, that, that's, the, that's the main purpose, is how you can work together. On the 23rd, if it turns out you can't work with the people on your team, or nobody communicates, which is a common thing. You have to the 23rd to switch teams. And for the teams that have one participant that's a jerk and the other two aren't, you have to the 23rd to kick that person off. So this is just like an episode of Survival Island Lubbock. Um, and to kick a teammate off, two of the three have to jointly prepare. I, just a short note saying, they never showed up to our two meetings. They didn't come up with an excuse. We don't want them anymore. It's your one and only chance to do that. After that, um, you're all stuck with each other. Normally, that doesn't happen too often. Uh, the usual things on the teams, the usual emails that I get is, I did everything and nobody else helped. And that, that is probably bullshit, but that is a common email. Or I did all the hard work and then I couldn't make one meeting and nobody else has helped. That's just dysfunctional. It's not, this is not that hard of a project. There is no good reason why you should have to switch teammates, especially if you get to pick the teams. Okay, the other project, look at them recording. Um, so there's all sorts of starting data in the concrete one. <clears throat>
The other project that is pretty mature, that's fancy, that's grown up way of saying it would probably actually work, is instrument calibration. And ironically, this seems much more engineering related, but you're actually doing the same thing. So either of these two projects are equal in terms of the intellectual input required to get them done. And this, they got a picture of a widget. That's a widget with a spinny thing on it. So those are good widgets. And then a schematic of how the widget works. And it's, it's a, I think it's a pressure instrument. Yeah, PSI pressures. And it goes through an instrument calibration exercise. Uh, dates are the same. Database. Oh, that database is even. Oh, that database still exists. I don't have to change that. Sweet. Um, exploratory data analysis. Build a model. Again, the same documentation. Training video. Project management video. Interim report. We'll keep it with the due date because changing it by one day is stupid. It's just a chance for me to break stuff. And uh, again, you break the project down in that first report. And if you find you can't work with your teammates, get rid of them. If you find you can't work with your team, you can ditch it. But it doesn't mean you ditch the project because there's only two. There's going to be a third one. There'll, there'll be only three choices. If you end up on a team of one, which could happen, uh, you go ahead and finish the project and do the best you can, and you'll get you'll get graded on the project as a team of one. Obviously, demonstrates ability to work on a team. That part of your project score is going to be pretty lousy. Uh, but if you're clever, maybe you can get a picture of your cat and say the cat helped as the team motivator provided massages and uh, emotional support as needed. Um, these, these projects aren't hard. You can make them hard. Um, over the years, I've seen people take what I think, I think it's an easy project, but then of course I created the thing and I don't have to get a grade in this class. Um, but all that aside, they take an easy project and they make it hard. They make it hard by not communicating with each other arguing over stupid shit. Kind of like if you watch the TV news, you can see uh, Washington, D.C. is a prime example of how not to operate as a team. Um, the only difference between you and them is they get the access to other people's money and, and use that to uh, flush it down the toilet. So the best advice is put together a team Meet electronically or face-to-face. -face. I mean, go to a bar. Actually, this stuff's probably better if you're pretty intoxicated while you're planning out the project. And uh, just lay out who's going to do what and, and set deadlines. And, so, okay, so next Wednesday, we're all going to meet by Zoom and just make a quick report to me, the team manager, and we'll see where we stand. And if things are progressing along, we're good. We'll just meet another week. If you didn't do something, please have a good reason when you come to that meeting, and we'll s proceed forward from that. And obviously, we haven't given you any training on this. You can try to figure it out on your own. Um, who are actual freshmen in this room? Oh, okay. So the rest of you all already know that this stuff is going to be, you're going to have this done to you for the next four years. Um, you have a choice now. You could be the worst teammate ever, and nobody will ever pick you again. And that, that might work out for you. Or just be kind of a quiet, so so one and not through life rather than fight all this team stuff. You do have to protect yourself as everybody and be sure that you keep records of everything that the team does. In case you have to become a team of one, you at least have something to show for it. Don't be the person that is just a, I call them coat hangers, but I think the uh, airborne term is strap hanger. It's hanging on the strap as you're jumping out of the airplane, hoping that the parachute's going to stop you and them. Um,
when you take your knife out, you cut those straps. Like, you can beat me to the ground. Make a big hole that's nice and soft. Okay. That's jasmine. You can see how I get confused. Same hair tie back. So Jasmine, as you, that is Jasmine, right? Yeah. Yes. As you wandered in, we were talking about the team exercises, uh, teams of three to four people. And I, I would say use the lab today to try to set up that team, do it in the private chat. That way, actually, the software will pick that up, but I won't see it until I actually render the chat transcript. Um, I was just babbling about teamwork and how unpleasant it can be. Are you a real freshman or? Okay, so you've already gone through this. This team stuff is real popular in higher education, right? It has been for eight or ten years. Um, oh, I'm being recorded. I'll go ahead and put it recorded. So when I went to uh, college, that was a long time ago. Cell phones weren't invented yet. Um, dinosaurs only recently stopped roaming the earth. Uh, they, they weren't into this team stuff. In fact, it was almost a form of cheating in the eyes of um, our instructors. Nevertheless, we still did meet at the coffee shop every morning and do our statics homework together. I don't know why I clicked on that. So. Anyway, things change. That's that's uh, one thing that uh, you can count on. All right, let's move on to today's lesson topic. Um, today we're going to look at something called interval estimates. Yeah, we saw couple of times ago when we were estimating what the average rate weight of all of us in this classroom was, we came up with an average of 127 pounds. Okay, so anybody who weighs more than 127 pounds, raise their hand. So one, two, four, six, seven. 127 or less, hands up. So we got two. Um, so we had two that were less than, seven that were greater than. I would I would argue that my 127 pounds is actually a pretty piss poor point estimate of the average value. But if I made a guess that says the weight of the people in this room, the average weight is somewhere between 125 and 151 pounds, that interval is, is more likely to contain whatever our actual mean value is. And that's the idea of an interval estimate. And rather than going for a point estimate, we want to provide an interval estimate, usually square bracketed, it has a low value, and what we're especially interested in doing is building that estimate in such a fashion that our type 1 error, which is the, think of it as the probability of being wrong, is kind of small. So we might set type 1 error at 5%, and so the chance of us producing an interval that does not contain the true mean value um, when we're calculating the true mean value correctly, the chance of that happening is not going to be five percent or less. So that would mean if we did that one hundred times, constructed that interval same way for one hundred different times. Ninety-five of those times is going to contain the point estimate. Five times the point. When it's done in that way, when the 
95% of the times it contains the evidence, it goes by a, uh, a fancy name, has the word interval in it, and what do you think the first word is? It's, it's you've seen it before. What you have when you're sure when you're sure you're gonna win. Yeah, okay, so you could. And actually your quizzical look as you said it was perfect. Yeah, it's called a confidence interval if we construct it that way. If we construct the interval, um, and we state the construction that that interval 95% of the time will contain the point estimate, although we don't necessarily know what the population point estimate is, we don't have to. That we call a 95% confidence interval. 5% of the time, the interval won't contain the estimate when in fact it should. So the, the type one error is still alpha. The other way of expressing it is just an interval estimate. We say the probability that this interval does not contain the population value is 5%. As that's <coughs> the basis of interval estimates. If I wanted a 99.99999 bunch of nines percent confidence interval of the mean value of weight in this room right now, body weights, somebody postulate what that interval might look like. What would be the low end? Zero. Why not less than zero? You don't believe in negative weights? You do not have a future in the diet supplement industry with that attitude. Um, okay, upper end. 500. Okay, I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah, an interval of zero pounds to 500 pounds pretty damn sure guaranteed to get the average value of the body weights in this room. Any of you 500 pounders here just um, like wrapped two layers of Spanx around your body <laughs> so that you could fit through that door? And <laughs> the room shakes as you come in. Okay, so that is our humorous introduction to interval estimates. And let's go... say it. Let's go take a look. So this should be lesson 18. You'll notice in lesson 18 there's only a lab 18. There's no lab 18 HW. What does that mean? No there's no homework. I I will probably regret that in the future because I, I, I rather would prefer to just have the homework in the lab point to the same place, but you're all going to tell me that I did it and I kept getting the same thing, and so I just broke it. Okay, so here's our lesson 18. Um, I'll try to run from the HTML until I actually have to do script. Now, let's not be that stupid. Why don't we just do it right? I can crash my home computer today. Shouldn't be that hard. That's right. I click on that and it goes away. All right, interval estimates. So there's a couple of kinds of intervals. You'll see confidence intervals quite frequently. They make it into into Hollywood and stuff, um, especially if they're doing things on nuclear warfare and missiles. You know, confidence is high. 
How do you know that? Because they launched every missile from the Soviet Union towards the United States, and then there's all these things coming down on the map on the big board. Confidence is high they're going to hit something. But that's because of gravity. It has nothing to do with uh, statistics. And another type of interval is a prediction interval. So remember when we were doing our blue lines through red dots, and we would predict something. Um, that prediction is a point prediction. It's also possible to specify an interval for that prediction. So, so the time at 13 seconds, the velocity of our rocket is 5,000 kilometers per second plus or minus 200 kilometers per second. That would be a prediction interval. And it's very similar in um, fundamental concepts, but they're, they're calculated by different techniques. If you can do one, you can certainly figure out how to do the other. Um, most of the material is taken from this textbook in testing of hypothesis. And this federal document that's having a hard time downloading, <laughs> really hard time. Oh, it's probably getting its vaccine right now. That is bizarre. Well, maybe it'll get here in our lifetimes. Um, a lot of the following material is, is taken from both. So let's start with our discussion of interval estimates. Um, we looked at some statistics before uh, that described key attributes of data sets, our five number summary, if you will. So we had sample estimates such as the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, the usual symbols for those our X bar and lowercase s. Uh, if you square it, it's called the sample variance. And we also talked about population values, kind of um, going by the side, but mu is the population mean and sigma squared is the population variance. So if we have the entire population and we can sample it without destroying it, um, we can certainly get population values, at which point point estimates sort of don't matter because you're not estimating if you have the whole population. Um, but we don't always have that luxury. And in addition to not always having that luxury, we want to have some feel for the uh, reliability of the estimates. I can get a mean value of weights in this class. I want to know some feel for how reliable that is. Now given there's nine or ten of us in here right now, and a class is a class of 50, um, that's a pretty small sample. It's 10 out of 50, that's 20 percent of the whole class. We wouldn't be as comfortable with that estimate as, say, if we had half the class. It may be the best we can do. So we'll start with sample median and sample mean as just measures of central tendency. Um, and such estimates are called point estimates. Now they're easy to make. How would you calculate the mean of, of a series? You type the series name, dot symbol, function mean, open close parentheses, and letter rip. And the magic of the computer would do it for us. Now all it's going to do is add up everything and divide by how many things there are and report that back to us. Um, but knowing that mean doesn't tell us much about the reliability or lack of reliability of that estimate in the context of the overall population it came from. And here's an example. Suppose we have two data sets, CapX and CapY. They exist, and they both have a sample mean of about 50. Let me suppress the plot initially. So we're going to create these two data series, and then we will go ahead and uh, describe them. Let's look what we're going to do. We're going to create one named 
We can create a process one and a process two. Those are just empty lists. And in the process one, we're going to put um, the numbers one to 100 inclusive. And in the process two, we're going to put the numbers 41 to 61 inclusives. So process two is going to contain 20 things. Process one will contain 100 things. And I've picked those things so that the mean value should be uh, about 50. They won't be exactly 50, but about 50. Then we will sample from each of those sets. So process one will take 500 samples with replacements. We'll pick a number out, throw it in a bucket, and then put the number back. Pick another number out. I guess write it down and throw the paper in the bucket, put the number back. So we'll do that 500 times for each of them. So that's probably a pretty good random sampling of a bucket that only has 20 things in it or a bucket that only has 100 things in it. Do it 500 times, we should get a pretty good idea of, of what's in that bucket. Then from those, we'll make them into data frames and we will give them very uh, slick names and then we'll do a describe function. So let's run that. And if we do that, we get our CapEx set that contains 500 things, has a mean value of 48.50, which kind of makes sense if it contains the numbers 1 through 100. That, that, that kind of makes sense. And then our second one that contains the numbers 41 through 61 has a mean value of 51, also not quite 50. Um, but look at the standard deviations of the two. They're quite different, as to be expected, because the 1 to 100 is a much larger range than the 41 to 61. The quartiles uh, for the X are 24, 46, 73, and 99. What I would have expected if I was able to get a good sampling of 1 to 100 is the quartiles would have been 25, 50, 75, and the max would be 100. Our max value being 99 leads me to believe it's actually picking the numbers up 1 to 99 and not 1 to 100. Let's test that conjecture. And we're not picking up, see we are picking up to 60. I'll go with that. And so now it's picking up the numbers as I expected. Now if we look at the um, Y group, mean of 50, um, our minimum, maximum makes sense. And uh, our quartiles also make sense in the context of that collection of numbers, uh, but they're much, um, much more around 50. Now if we go ahead and plot it, let's see what we can see. So there are the two groups. We have the orange group and the blue group. And in a plot, it's pretty obvious what's going on. They both have, for all practical purposes, the same mean value, but we're describing two entirely different things. And so with just the mean and value alone, we're not learning enough about our underlying uh, process. We might be somewhat more interested in the variance. We could take the difference between those two mean values and collect differences and do this over and over again and then decide if they're the same or, or different or not. We had tests to do that, our Shapiro, Wilkes, Mann, Whitney, and all that stuff. So let's just go ahead and look at Shapiro, Wilkes. Let's see if our CapEx um, values for mean are probably normal. In this case, it says they're Abbey normal, so not normal. And we'll do the same for Y. I've obviously changed the script. Also Abbey normal. Who knows what movie that's from? Young Frankenstein. Watch it. 
you'll get the Abbey normal reference at that point. And if we were to um, compare the means between the two, we would um, conclude that they probably have different mean values, although they're, they're arguably pretty close to 50. And that's all we can get from that. So at this point, we know the mean value. Alternative to just point estimates, interval estimates are intervals that have a stated probability of containing the true population value, even if we don't know what it is. In our example, the mean value for y is 50, and we're pretty sure of that because the sample variance is small. If our sample had also tested as normal, we could have stated the estimate of population mean is 50 plus or minus 18, where 18 would have been three standard deviations with probability of 99%. That's because it would be normal at that point. We have the power of the normal distribution then. Such a statement is an interval estimate. So if you see something stated like the value is 50 plus or minus something, that's an interval estimate. In general, we'll do two centered intervals uh, where the probability of the true value being higher than the upper limit is assumed to be equal to the probability of it being lower than the lower limit. So we're looking at two edges of the distribution. And um, we'll use that. And in the above example, an interval between 38 and 62 may have a 95% probability of containing the unknown true population mean of data set Y. It would take a much wider interval, say minus 6 to 106, to have the same probability of containing the true mean of data set X. So the the interval width gives us a clue to how variable or non-variable the data is. The difference in reliability of the two estimates can be clearly stated using interval estimates and provide two pieces of information which point estimates cannot. <clears throat> the two pieces are interval estimate can provide a statement of the probability or likelihood that the interval contains the true population value so that's its reliability, and a statement of the likelihood that a single data point with specified magnitude comes from the population under study. That is a prediction interval. Um, though they're related, the two types of estimates are not identical, and you've got to avoid the habit of interchanging. So first we could take a visit to the textbook, but I'm not going to do that because it all looks like you're passing out anyway. But let's remember our friends percentiles. So numerical data can be sorted in increasing or decreasing order. How do you do that? Well, keyword sort and put it in front, behind, around, or go look on the internet to see how to sort it. Or God forbid you reach into the bucket and put them in order just like you did back during your Sesame Street days or whatever television program was used to grow you up. Um, so the values in a data set have a rank order. And it's not how bad they stink, but the, the rank they are. The lowest one might be ranked number one, the second lowest number two. That would be an ascending order sort. Descending order, biggest one is number one, second biggest number two, and so forth. So ascending or descending is, is as much an analyst choice as anything else. Avoid the habit of mixing the two in any particular analysis because it will just screw everything up. Um, we, the words here suggest that we study plotting positions formulas. We're actually going to do that next time, so it's kind of out of order. But this ranking of a uh, data set is fairly important and exploited in a lot of uh, contexts in data science. For example, if your score on a test is in the 95th percentile, a common interpretation is that only 5% of the scores were higher than yours. The median is the 50th percentile. It's commonly assumed that half the values in data are above the median and half are below. 
If you get 95 on the test, that's not necessarily a 95th percentile. Um, but most tests, historically, they make them out of 100 points because it makes the arithmetic easier, and you can get to gray shaded areas under the curves. And so if, if, the test, if the test score is an accurate representation of the percentile of the class taking it, then maybe the score does indeed mean 95% did worse, 5% did better. But usually test scores are basically, if you're not cheating, you're not trying, that category all the way up to nailed it. Um, they're a lot tighter and shoved towards the higher end. I'll have to make a whole lecture on that someday so I can explain the arbitrary and capricious grading system that's in full effect in other classes. See, I knew it was being recorded when I said that. <laughs> um, okay, where am I at? But some care is required in giving percentiles a precise definition that works for all ranks and all lists. To see why, I consider an extreme example where all students in a class score a 75 on a test. So everybody gets a 75. Then that 75 is a natural candidate for the median, but it's also no longer true that half the class are below 75 and half are above 75. Also, 75 is an equally natural candidate for the 95th percentile or the 25th or any other percentile. Ties, that is, have to be taken into account when dealing with percentiles, and that becomes a big deal in data science when we're using um, percentiles to make interval estimates, which is mainly our only tool, so we're kind of stuck with it. Um, let's give a pseudo-definition of percentiles. Um, well, we have to be careful how far up the list we go when the relevant index isn't clear. For example, what should be the 87th percentile of a collection of 10 things? 80th percentile is pretty easy. If there's 10 things, the 8th thing should be a good candidate for the 80th percentile. But what about the 87th percentile? Is it the 8th thing or the 9th thing? I don't know. Um, by convention, we usually go to the next higher thing. So it would probably be the ninth thing. Again, we've already addressed this issue with plotting positions formula earlier, which is next time. And as a numerical example, um, we'll define the 80th percentile of a collection of the values <coughs> to be the smallest value in the collection that is at least as large as 80% of the values. So, for example, let's consider the five largest continents. Africa, America, Asia, no, Africa, Antarctica, Asia, North America, and South America. Let's try and get the America sound out of there. North America and South America. Rounded to the nearest million square miles. Um, so, Africa is 12 million square miles. Antarctica is 17. I didn't know that. Asia is a mere 6. North America is 9. South America is 7. That's a lot of millions of square miles. Um, and so we will go ahead and make an array named sizes. And there's our array. So the 80th percentile, by definition, is the smallest value that is at least as large as 80% of the elements of sizes. That is four-fifths of the five elements. So we'll sort the array. And there's our array sorted. One, two, three, four, five. So our 80th percentile should be 12. And you can see that 80% of the values are less than or equal to 12. So 12, 9, 7, 6 are less than or equal to 12. 17 is bigger than. Obviously, the 70th percentile is the smallest value in the collection, which is equally, at least as large as 70. Now, 70% 70 of five elements is three and a half elements. So the 75th percentile, by definition, is the fourth element, which also happens to be 12. Same as the 80th percentile. So it's not terribly useful as currently presented. 
but wait, there's more. There's our friend, the percentile function. So in the data science module, there's a function called percentile. It takes two arguments, a rank between 0 and 100, and an array. And it returns the corresponding percentile of the array. So for example, in the sizes array of continents, we put in a 70, we get a 12. So this is mostly just a programming convenience. Put in 80 and get a 12. Put in 81, and I'm betting we're going to get a 17. OK, so we have this percentile function, which um, basically does the counting for us. And now let's look at a general definition of a percentile. And this will come in handy when we talk about plotting position formulas, which are used extensively in probability estimation modeling. Let p be a number between 0 and 100. And the pth percentile of a collection is the smallest value in the collection that's at least as large as p percent of all the values. And by this definition, any percentile between 0 and 100 can be computed for any collection of values. And it's always an element of the collection. So in practical terms, suppose there's n elements. To find the pth percentile, sort the collection. Find the pth percentile of n is p divided by 100 times n. Um, call that value k. If k is an integer, take the kth element of the sorted collection. If k is not an integer, round up to the nearest, to the next nearest integer and use that element. So that's our uh, formula. And there is a database in this URL called Scores in Sections. We're going to go ahead and just automatically download it and run it in a second. And it contains the scores for students in a class of 359 students. Oh, that worked. And so there's what um, the thing looks like. It has a section, so like section one, section two, three, four, and it's probably section eight for the crazy students. And then midterm values, 22, 12, 23, 14. And there's 350 additional rows. And sadly, the data science module in the UC Berkeley data science class has this table function, but it didn't inherit properties of a data frame. That was kind of stupid on their part. I guess they had a plan for what they were doing. We can make a histogram of that, of those scores. So we're going to, we're going to make a histogram um, of the midterm scores. So it's a midterm exam. So what kind of elements do you think the histogram will have? Will it have negative values in it? No, because we don't, we don't deduct for not showing up. Oh, that would be a really interesting mathematical thing. I'd nail it in this classroom today, right? Um, and assuming the exam is, I'm guessing the exam doesn't go above 25, just looking at these first 10 numbers. But it's not going to go above 100. So yeah, we expect, we expect 0 and 100. It actually looks like 25 is the largest number. So there is the histogram, and let's let it make it again. OK, so look at that histogram. And uh, how many people should be considering another line of work? For sure. I'd, I'd do six. I think the one, the one should be grouped in that other line of work along with the zeros. You had five that didn't, probably didn't show up. You had one that showed up, put their name on it because the way the algorithm was worked, they got a point for their name. So those, those are uh, not very useful. What's the median? What's the median uh, value? Half above, half below. How would you, how could you do that? Describe a way to guess the median. All I want is a guess. So if, if that histogram was made up of steel bars, 
all welded together. The median would occur where you could put a fulcrum and it would balance. Same amount of weight on one side of the steel bar as the other side of the steel bar. So where would where does that thing to you look like it might balance? If I put the fulcrum at five, would it balance? Which way would it fall? Fall to the right. If I put the fulcrum at 24, would it balance? Would fall left. left. And if I put the fulcrum at 10, right, right, um, 20. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that too. Uh, 16. 16 kind of looks like that would be a place where it might balance. And so we just by eyeballed, whether we know it or not, we were doing percentile evaluations of this data. So if we go for the balance point, which occurs at the 50th percentile, you disobeyed me. There we go. 16. So that's where it balances. Now let's say we're interested in the 85th percentile. So 16 represents half of it. If we go about there, 21 would be about 75. So the 85th percentile is somewhere 21 or 22. And we can test that conjecture. Oh, I see what I did wrong. 22. So you can eyeball big ones pretty, pretty easily if you have your uh, histogram plotted. So our eyeball value is not too bad. According to our percentile function, the 85th is 22. To check that's consistent with the definition, let's just apply it directly. So we're going to go ahead and take the scores in sections and create an object called sorted scores and then we'll get its length. Its length is 359. So 85% of 359 is 305.15. That's not an integer. By definition, the 85th percentile is the 306th element of sorted scores, but Python counts from zero. So we want to find the 305th element of the array. So if we do that, sure enough, we get 22. So that's all the percentile thing is doing, is all of that uh, behind the lines. We can um, break it into quartiles, which by definition are the 25th, 50, and 75th. If we do that for our data, we get 11, 16, and 20. We could get smart and put it into a data frame, and then all of a sudden we can use tools that make sense. We get 11, 16, and 20, and so we get all the same values. So that's a quick descriptive um, approach if we want to uh, look at percentiles. Next topic is something called bootstrapping. Uh, this is actually hugely important. Not so much for your immediate future, other than you have to be aware of it in this class. Um, but you'll see, that I hope you will see by the end of my babbling, that um, this is how statistical intervals are invented. You take a known distribution, you make, make some samples from it, millions of them, you let the computer, and you use that to help you guide how to build interval estimates that have the desired probabilistic properties. So we'll go through, um, go through an example. Um, what motivated bootstrapping a while back, and actually a long while back, a data scientist was using the data in a random sample to estimate some unknown parameter, mean, median, mode, whatever. Use the sample to calculate that measurement. But once you've calculated that measurement, you could simply report it and go on about the merry way, which would be what I would do because I'm lazy. But that sample is just one of numerous possible samples that could have been taken. And so that estimate is just one of numerous possible estimates. How do those estimates vary? Don't know. Um, 
One answer would be, well, I'll just take more samples from the original population. Now, if, it, if you can sample from the original population easily, such as by the mighty social media net, uh, you do it. But if it's a sample that um, is like whole species sampling and it's a destructive sample, all you have less is a pork chop, it's not too useful to resample from that population because besides getting full on pork chops, there won't be many pigs left. Um, but you don't have the cash to go back and draw another sample. So if we were working for the Republican National Committee or the Democratic National Committee, we'd just make the freaking numbers up, report it to them, take the check, and go on home. Um, or we can go from the sample we have and make the logical step. Well, that sample is somehow representative of the population. I'm going to declare the sample. Sample, you are a population. Not the population, but a population. So we call them the American people. I'm not trying to get political here, but it seems funny. It's in my head right now. So now we have this sample that we have declared as a population. And we resample from it. And we're making the logical transitive step that if A is the original population, if A generated B, B has features of the original population that will propagate on down subsequent resamplings. And so we sample from B as if B were the whole population. And we can use that to um, get some assessment of the reliability of whatever thing we're trying to estimate. And that obviously gets better if that first sample had a lot of things. In this room, us 10 people sampling 50, that's 20% of the whole population. That's actually probably pretty big in a percentile way of thinking. Um, but it wouldn't be very good. But if we sampled uh, of the whole Texas Tech campus, that would start giving us some reasonable information on the weight distribution of tech employees and uh, students and staff. Okay, we're going to look at why the city of San Francisco is going broke by looking at the employee compensation database from 2015, so seven years ago. Um, so I have a copy on a remote database, and we'll go ahead and load that in. And we'll look at the table. And so it has year... Organization, group, code, group, department, and then way over here is total compensation for that particular employee. There should be an employee number. So there's an employee number right there. And there are, I think there's about 36,000 or something in this database. There's a bunch of them. It doesn't have the employee number who picks up the... Um, poop on the sidewalks in the Tenderloin district, but they'd be one of the lowest playing points. So there's 42,979 employees in this database. Um, at the time, Mayor Ed Lee was the mayor, and we could find out that the mayor was paid $380,000 a year. Not bad. I mean, of course, you still have to be a mayor of San Francisco, and you can't hide away in City Hall too long. Although there's good restaurants nearby, if you got to do takeout, maybe you could. And we can sort by total compensation. So, was the mayor the highest-paid person? So this is an <clears throat> increasing uh, sort. I think if I, I think if I do the tail, no, it's not a data frame. We're just going to have to live with it. 
we'd have to scroll down and find the highest paid person. The lowest paid person in 2015 was a firefighter that received a total compensation of negative $423. So they thought being a firefighter was cool. They wanted to get in the calendar. So they paid the San Francisco Fire Department almost $500. Let me ride around on a truck and put the hat on and dress up in bunker gear and, and be cool. So they got to be a firefighter for a day. And that's, that's how they raised enough money to operate um, various agencies in San Francisco. Uh, I'm just kidding. I have no idea if they do that. that that's got to be wrong if a city did, but just wait and see. You never know what's going to happen. So for clarity, we're going we're gonna to knock off everyone from the database who made less than $10,000 a year. Because if you're making less than ten grand a year in San Francisco, we don't want you. So that leaves us with 36,500 people. Um, let's go ahead and just make a histogram of them. And we get a warning message, which I will ignore. It just says, now that you got it to work, we're going to change it so it won't work next time you use it. Um, and this, so there's our total compensation history. And look at the axis. It goes out to 700,000. It doesn't look like there's any bars there, but it won't extend that far. There, there is at least one data point in there. So someone in this city makes almost $700,000 a year, which is not bad. Um, most of the people make about what is the histogram balance? Yeah, that's a pretty good change. It's not much in San Francisco. They'd be able to live in public housing. Um, and so we can, we can do a descending sort, and we'll just show the first two. So we're, we're out here in this high region. And it turns out that the chief investment officer is the highest paid employee at 648875 And that's the money of his that we can find. But the chief embezzlement officer is probably also adding those, those negative $400 stuff. He's taking their money, too. Cheater. And then the assistant medical examiner, that's the one who, um, who is, handles all the dead bodies and, and is hired by all the television shows that shoot in San Francisco, so he's really busy, and his external compensation is huge. Uh, he makes 480000 and the mayor makes a mere 300000 What is the assistant big money making actually? It's San Francisco, man. <laughs> I'm damned if I know. Um, now let's go ahead and measure the median of the total compensations. So we'll use our percentile function, or we could or we could write script to do it ourselves, but since it's built here, we'll do that. We're going to call that the POP median. We do that, and the median is 110,305. Not bad. That's what you all guessed. You all guessed 100,000, either by looking or you scrolled down ahead. Either way, good enough. So our median is 110,300. From a practical perspective, we have the whole population, so we wouldn't have to do samples. But let's pretend we don't. So we're going to pretend we don't know this true value, and we'll see how well we can estimate it based on the sample. So we're going to produce a sample called our sample. From that, we're going to um, select the total compensation key, and we're going to make a histogram of it, and then we're going to estimate the median of our sample total compensation column and find the 50th percentile and then we'll report that. So we draw a pretty picture. Our, our estimated median in this random sample of 500 employees is 111,122. 111, Compared to the population one, that's not bad, but remember in practice we wouldn't know the population one. Uh, we managed to pick up the rich dude. That's kind of amazing. The sample size is 
probably reasonably large in this case, so that the distribution of the sample approximates the population, and consequently the sample median is not too far from the population median. So now we have one estimate. But if the sample had come out differently, let's go ahead and get a different one. If we do it again, we get a different number, and the shape of the distribution changes a little bit. What if we do that over and over again in a systematic fashion? That's called bootstrapping, and we'll resample from the sample. And when we do that, um, we will build a large collection of estimates, and we can start to make some assertions based on those. So first, we'll create our resample, our first resampling, second one. And then we had this one up here. So we now have 112,900, 115,300, 109,500. We'll repeat that many, many times, and then we will use those to come up with an interval for the population estimates. So here's a function called bootstrap median, and it works in the following fashion the sample name, the column you want it to look for, and how many times you want to uh, redo it, the replications. And this is adapted from the University of California Berkeley script. And so we are going to create the function. And now we're going to come up with a collection of medians called bootstrap medians. We're going to send it our sample. So we've only made that sample once. Search on total compensation, make 5,000 replicants, and hopefully this, let's just do five, I need an idea how long this is going to run. Okay, that was pretty quick. Still pretty quick. Quick enough, okay, so I think 5,000 will happen quickly enough. Naturally, okay, so we've just done 5,000 um, samples of the original sample. And let's go ahead and make a histogram of it. So there's our histogram. And on that, you can barely see a little red dot right there at 110,000. That's the population value. Because we have the God privilege of knowing what the population value is, we can plot it on there. And so those sample medians from 5,000 resampling of the original sample, um, if we were took the low end and the high end, uh, we would we would, in many cases, clearly bracket the true population value. So we want to ask the question in one minute or less, do the estimates capture the parameter? Now we have to have some fun. So we're going to define a left and right limit using our percentile function. And we're going to do it on the bootstrap medians, and we're going to find what the Two and a half percentile is of the left. We'll declare that a lower bound and then 97 and a half percentile on the right, upper bound, and that now defines a interval. And then we'll ask, did that interval capture the um, true value of 110? So let's go ahead and ask that question. And sure enough, on whatever the current value of bootstrap median is, uh, we got 107,000 on the low end, 119 on the high end. That does catch our, our 110. So we're a happy camper. Our one attempt to do that did indeed capture the true number. So we'll do our plot again, and this time we're going to draw that range as a yellow line. The yellow line is our interval estimate. Did the yellow line capture the red dot? That'd be a yes. 
I'm aware it's almost time for lab. Don't don't get too antsy. We will quit in just a couple. We'll run the big simulation without me discussion. This takes a while to run. Um, in fact, I I have to run it because I need to populate the data. But I will scroll down. So pretend we ran the big simulation. It takes about eight minutes to run on my computer. It'll be faster on yours. So we're playing the same game again, and we're keeping track of all those yellow bars. And we keep it in a object called intervals, and it has a left and a right column. We still know our population median, um, and we'll use a function that lets us keep track of the left and right, and then we plot them. Okay, so that's 100 samples from the original sample 5,000 times per yellow line. So there's a lot of, a lot of gonculation gone in there. The vertical red line is what the population value is. And if we were to go through the trouble and count all the yellow lines that contain the red portion, we'd get about 95 out of 100 would indeed contain. I think it's 93 in this particular example. Oh good, I don't actually do it. Um, you, you can set up a script to do the counting and um, you get about, you should get 95. I think in this particular instance, if you were to do it and you get the same numbers I do, you'd get 93. So pretty darn close. So if we construct an interval the same way we did that one interval just before we made this plot, then we're, we're guaranteed that if we do that 100 times, 95 times, that interval is going to contain an unknown parameter. And that's how these intervals are used to create statistical measures for a lot of things. So we read a statistics book and they have this elaborate thing, z-score plus or minus some percent. At some point in the past, they ran simulations like this in order to figure out how to construct an interval that guarantees a particular performance. And what we're controlling is type 1 error. Now, is it possible to get an interval that doesn't contain the population value? Absolutely. Um, but our chances of that happening are 5% in this case. We built it in such a way that most of the time it will get it. Uh, we can play the same game for another one for the median, and I'm just skipping down. So here's a median for different kind of data, and here's how you would you would count. Oh, did I break the part? Yeah, there we go. Here's how you would uh, count uh, whether or not you've captured the population mean. In this particular example, that one is designed to have a 90% confidence interval. So if you construct the interval. get the right if you construct the interval this way once and the way that was built um, you have a 95 percent chance of capturing the population value and that's the point of interval <coughs> estimates so I will let you go now and we will start on time at 9 30. Thank you for your attention and have a good Tuesday.